This is the podcast I Do What I Want. I am Hollis, your host and creator and author of fantasy. And this podcast is all about books and things of that nature because I'm an author of fantasy and a control freak. And so I get to have full control over this world and podcast. Very exciting for me. Anyway, this week, or, you know, by week, whatever, uh, August 6th, we are going to be talking about a character study of Lucretia, who is the main character of Spare the Swallow, as well as the main character of the upcoming series, The Lost Beacon Chronicles, which ignited the first book will be coming out November 16th is when I have set that. I am done with the first draft. I am editing right now and, um... Yeah, I'm really excited about Ignited. Honestly, I am. So uh, it's, it's, it's a lot, and it's cool, and I'm ready. Uh, other than that, before we get into her character study, of course I have other announcements for you, because that's what we do here. Uh, basically, so To Save a World, second edition, is out. It's beautiful. I'm so thrilled with the page layout and the new cover. It's gorgeous in my eyes. I designed it, so, you know, I'm very biased. But my mom says it's really beautiful, so... There you go. My sister-in-law and dad and brother and, you know, my friends. Everybody tells me it's gorgeous. I choose to believe them, even though they love me. So <laughs> there's that. The Queen Witch, of course, has been out with its gorgeous cover that matches. Uh, and that is the book two in the Rashan series, the other fantasy series that I write. And that's out. So both To Save a World and The Queen Witch are available for purchase wherever books are sold. Go get yourself a copy enjoy. I'm really excited. The Rajan series will have another book coming up in um, 2024, and that will be Tear in the World. It is a little more, a lot more Aram-focused. For those of you who have already read either To Save a World and or The Queen Witch, you know who Aram is. Or if you've watched or listened to previous episodes, I did a character study on Aram. So... That's exciting. And you will know who he is via that character study episode. I want to say it was like episode 16 or something. I'm sort of pulling that out of out of the air. Um, yeah, something like that. But anyway, I'm really excited. Tear in the World is coming in 2024. And another quick announcement is Dragon Con is coming up, which Labor Day weekend, for those of you who are not familiar with the with the nerd cycles of conventions, every Labor Day weekend, Dragon Con in Atlanta, one of the biggest cons in America, uh, possibly the world. Dragon Con's pretty huge. I think it I think it gets about a hundred thousand people. It gets this is big. It's big. Um, it's the second biggest. I think Comic Con and Dragon Con are the two biggest in the U.S., which is exciting. I'm gonna be there. I tried to get a booth this year. Uh, competition is tough. It's a huge con, and everybody wants a booth, so didn't happen this year. But I will be there, handing out promotional materials, dressing up in cosplay, and you know, ready to talk about my books. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, hey, if you p take a picture of me or with me, you know, you'd want to take a little selfie with me if you find me as an author, then I will post you to my social media. And hey, if you have a book yourself or something like that, I will tag you. We will. I'll tag you anyway, but I'll help promote whatever whatever you've got on my Instagram. So, you know, we can help each other out. And that'll be fun. So come find me at Dragon Con this year. I will be there with Alara Dunn, who just released uh, on July 25th her first fantasy book, which is called The Magic Locker, The Witch's Curse. Uh, it is the first book in a fantasy series that I am very, very excited about. It, I, I actually haven't read it yet. I just got my copy. I'm going to do a social media post about it, and it's... It's a modern fantasy, I guess. A basically, high school girl who doesn't quite fit in, was bullied a lot in middle school and elementary school, but going into high school thinking it's gonna it's gonna be different. Um, of course, things don't go as planned, and uh, she accidentally opens a portal to another world. Says <laughs> things things happen, uh, but she's it's really cool and it's fully illustrated because the main character is really into art and drawing and keeping a journal and uh, she, the Alara did these gorgeous sketches herself and she tried to do them at like a um, 
like a 13 or 14 year old would be doing them of you know the journals and what she sees and the fantastical things and i'm really stoked to read it so i will be promoting that on my social media as well but let's get into spare the swallow and who is lucretia so spare the swallow for those of you who are not entirely familiar uh i've done a whole thing on the world of cell which is uh, I think like episode three of this podcast, which this takes place in. This is a historical fantasy novel. Uh, Lucretia is a Dokfen, which is a race of people I completely made up. Ah, we're fantasy authors. We get to do that. Uh, the Dokfens live for roughly 400 years. They are Mediterranean. They're based on the ancient Etruscans of Italy and have basically the same culture uh, and everything else except they have magic and they are a whole different race of people sorry for those of you watching the video i think my husband just shut that door entirely and it scared me uh they're a whole different race of people and um they you know like like elves are a whole different humanoid race and dwarves are a whole different humanoid race in fantasy books so doc vents are just a new thing of that they have gorgeous glittering eyes like gemstones in the sunlight and uh, that is the light of their souls actually showing through in a physical manifestation. And they're, they're absolutely stunning. But when a doc then dies, uh, the lights go out and their eyes are dull, which, uh, which is sad. But that's, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go into spoilers and spare the swallow. Let's talk about Lucretia. Uh, who is she? So we talked about the Doc Venn traits. Uh, they, you know, again, they look Mediterranean. Lucretia is a classic Mediterranean female. And um, I know it's going to sound like I'm describing myself, but I'm an Italian girl. So Lucretia has dark brown curly hair and brown eyes with she, her, her eyes. Actually, I always say they're brown and amber. I gave her a little depth of color there. And, um, you know, she's she's pretty. But it's not really focused on. I describe her as I, I describe her as uh, people say she's pretty to her, but she doesn't really think about it that much because it's honestly not that important to her whether or not she's physically beautiful. She's she's really confident, and um, and, and honest, and, and that's it. So she she looks you know imagine a Mediterranean woman with long dark curly hair and brown eyes that are just luminous with light. And she's maybe a little on the short side, like maybe 5'3"-ish, you know, not, not so petite that, that people like wonder how she reaches things, but shorter than average. And, uh, and she's really smart. She's a very clever person. She's very quick on her feet. She's quick witted and she's a good problem. So she's a great problem solver, uh, which is why she gets thrust into positions that she doesn't want. Lucretia being very confident and competent and clever, she honestly gets thrown into uh, positions of authority and leadership that she doesn't want, which, and I, and I will go ahead, for those who, who know me personally and who have read Spare the Swallow, they already know Lucretia's very much, like, a lot of authors base characters on themselves. Lucretia is based on me. I am obscenely confident. I've always been this way. <laughs> and and um, I'm, I'm not magic, though I wish I were. It'd be really cool. I wish I were magic. Um, and, and, and frankly, I am. I'm, really, I'm a really good problem solver. And... Uh, Growing up in school projects, everything, I was always voted the, the team lead. If there was a group project, I was always voted the one to speak on things. And I, I didn't want to. I don't have a problem doing it. I don't have stage fright in that context. But but I just, like, I don't have any desire to be the leader. And somehow I'm always, always the leader. Not my... Not my favorite, but uh, Lucre the same thing happens to Lucretia. I even got up, I was even the state rep for immigration. <laughs> I, yeah, I was, I got to be chair for two years of the Georgia International Educators Committee and everything. Um, and I never even threw my name in the hat. I was appointed because people just said she would do a good job at this. 
And I did. Honestly, I did a bang-up job at it. I usually do. But I don't try to get it. And that's <laughs> Lucretia's got that same energy where people are like, you know who gets things done? Her. Let's just... We don't even... Let's not even ask. Let's just make her the general of the army. And, uh, and Lucretia does not want that, but that happens. She... She's just, oh, okay, um, we're, we don't want to do this, and you're really good and direct, so um, please make decisions. And that's what happens to her. And she does, because she also is of the personality type that <laughs> she understands that people are, pu are pushing her into these positions of leadership and authority because they don't want to do it. And she knows she's capable of doing it, so she'll... She'll do it. She also values the opinions of others very highly, which, again, I do too. And uh, I, I'm always the first to say, I will ask for help very quickly. If I get to a point where I don't know what I'm doing or I think it could be better and I think that it, sh it better can't come from me, I am the first to raise my hand and say, help me. This is what I need. Please help me. I would love your input. And Lucretia is also that way, which honestly is also what makes her a very good leader. She she talks to her constituents. She she gets information. She she's well informed and she tries really hard to do her best. Because it's not she's not doing it for herself. She never even wanted to be in charge. She's doing it for the people who put her there. That's the thing, you know, they always say a true hero, or at least, you know, you read about it, that the true hero never wants to be a hero. They always want to be sitting on the curb with everybody else clapping as people go by. They're not, they're not a hero by choice, they're a hero because people beg them to be that, they beg them to do it, and they just don't want to let people down. And that's, that's honestly, the, Lucretia has that true heroism in her. She, she genuinely is, is purely motivated in the sense that she just wants people that she loves and cares about and her, you know, her people in general, speaking of the Doc Fen race, to, to have good, happy lives. And she wants to do her best for them. She could give a crap about the glory or any accolades it doesn't she doesn't care about any of that that doesn't matter to her what matters is to her is that the people she loves the people she serves are going to have that good life are going to have a good outcome she wants others to be happy she wants them to be safe and frankly if she had her way she would just be left alone <laughs> she would she would be left alone to live her life to have you know all these things and and I, I mean, that's what many people want. She's, she's very personally ambitious and she has goals. You know, she, she's a mage. She's, she's one of the blue mages in the book. That's what I call the, um, the magic users and only the Doc Vens of, as far as the races are concerned. You know, humans, elves, dwarves, only Doc Vens in the world of Cell have true magic. You know, the others can do things that are sciency that, that can be like magic, like we have in our present day, you know, real world, so to speak. Um, but this, Doc Vins have true magic. And that is something that, uh, um, you know, the human races in particular are kind of jealous of, of course. And Lucretia is one of the, the people who's learned to control it, to wield it. And we call that the Order of the Blue Mages, or I call that <laughs> as the author and creator of this world. I call it the Order of the Blue Mages. My favorite color is like a deep indigo blue. You know, so I just picked that. Which is really nice. She's She is young. Um, like I said, Doc Vins live for about 400 years. I think I said that Lucretia was about 75 at the beginning of Spare the Swallow. And that makes her, you know, roughly someone in their early 20s. By our standards, you know, they, they age much more slowly, so they remain in certain stages of life much longer than uh, that a human being would. So yeah, roughly in her early 20s, you know, thinking of somebody who just graduated college, essentially, you know, and um, that, that's her age. So she's just starting out. She's just starting out. She's got all these bright ideas, but she doesn't, 
she doesn't want to be the one in charge. She wants she wants to get her feet under her. She wants to figure out what she wants. And and honestly, that's at the beginning, that's her motivation. She just wants to figure out what she genuinely wants, but she does not get that chance. If you've read Spare the Swallow, you know things things hit the fan <laughs> and uh, it goes it goes south rather quickly. Uh poor Lucretia. However, one other reason she's often singled out as a leader, unwilling as she is, she's she's extremely resilient. She's very tough uh, emotionally and physically. She, you know, well, and honestly, the willpower that that rings rings through the physical. So uh, Lucretia isn't anything spectacular when it comes to physical feats of strength or speed or anything like that, but you can't knock her down. She, she's a trained fighter. She's learned how to fight. She's very competent. She's good. She's definitely not the best fighter in the book. Lucretia's got the heart. Then she holds her own in battle 100%. But she, what, what makes her more resilient physically is the fact that she will not give up. Her heart and her and her brain are just like, no, I'm going to keep trying. There's nothing else to do but try. That's what I'm going to do. And she will keep trying and trying and trying until she gets that good outcome that she truly strives for, for everyone, for herself and everyone that she cares about. That's what she really, really wants. And that's what is at the heart of her resilience is she just, she really, really deeply cares for for all those people and she just can't let them down. And that is the heart of her resilience, is that's why she never gives up. You know, she's a never give up, never surrender, to quote Galaxy Quest, which is a very fun movie, if you haven't seen it. Um, and yeah, but it, it, it's it's just that. she She's very tough because she's got the heart. And she's got the confidence and she's direct and she, you know. She, she's like that, which, again, <laughs> kind of based on me. <laughs> hmm. Another trait is she's impatient. Uh, if we're going to talk about some negatives, she's impatient. She <laughs> And she can definitely get angry quickly. She doesn't have what you would call a fiery temper. But, um, like, I would say that Ethne uh, from the Rashan series, uh, my, you know, my other series in the classical fantasy world, Ethne is definitely more of a fiery temper in a way. She, she has a little, you know, a little feistiness about her in that way. Lucretia is triggered by certain things, but she doesn't have a fiery temper. Like she'll take a lot, but if you flip the switch, if you say the thing that triggers in her brain ooh, she'll cut you quick you know whether whether verbally or you know depending on the situation in the books maybe she will cut you with an actual weapon who knows but she she can keep her cool a lot of the time and have a lot of patience unless you say something that is just like mm, how dare you? you know like it, it it just pushes the button for her and then and then she will turn on a dime on you she so to say that she has a, a, a bad temper is not accurate, but if you do something or say, you know, if you do something to someone she loves, that is a, that is a trigger. Uh, you, you will, you will not like your interaction uh, with Lucretia if you hurt someone she cares about. And, uh, and of course, if you, you know, say or do something that she just cannot abide, she will, she'll turn on a dime on you. She will get you, you know, cold as ice kind of gets you. Though she's not a burn with fire and yell at you person. She is a turn on you and cut you down person. Uh, so, so yeah, she, she's, um, she's tough in that sense. Uh, and that is not necessarily a positive trait. So, you know, so she does... Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a little hard to deal with. She's a workaholic. Uh, one of the things she gets so wrapped up in keeping the people that she cares about happy and trying her best and trying so hard that she's honestly 
becomes a workaholic and she forgets to take care of herself. She does not prioritize herself, which, you know, is a huge problem. That is a negative trait, negative for her especially, and honestly, eventually negative for the people she loves, because if, as we know, if you are not taking good care of you, then how can you take good care of others? And that is, that is kind of, honestly, that's her Achilles heel, is that she gets so wrapped up in fixing, 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 and helping, 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 and being the one who's in charge, that she just, you know, all her needs fall away. And she needs to be reminded that she matters. She does. She genuinely does. And, um, you know, Isaac in, in Spare the Swallow, if you've read it, her very best friend in the beginning of the book, and then it morphs into more as the story goes on. He is really good at seeing what she needs I love Isaac, as you know. If you've if you've you know heard other podcasts where I talk, I love Isaac. He is just wonderful. But he and he's very strong and he's very inte- he's so smart and I love intelligence and it's very sexy to me. <laughs> I love a smart man, um, but he also sees her and he sees her in a sense of seeing what she needs, not only seeing who she is but seeing what she needs. And so he, in the book, several times in Spare the Swallow, Isaac will stop and just kind of stop her and say, you know what? Come do this with me. And it will be always be something for her. It will, it will be something where he says, you, basically he says, you need to pause and you need to take care of yourself. And that's that. And she actually listens to Isaac. That the other thing, another negative trait is she doesn't, she doesn't always listen. <laughs> <laughs> Lucretia, Lucretia can passive aggressively, and this is another thing I took from myself. Like you be trying to tell her things, and she will be like, "Mm-hmm, that's nice," and then turn around and do whatever she was gonna do anyway. The name of this podcast is "I Do What I Want." You should know that about me. And uh, Lucretia is exactly the same way. And sometimes that works out, and sometimes there was a better way to do it or you really should have uh, listened. And she, you know, when it's something to do with her personally, that's how she is. When it's something to do with the political situation in the book or something like that, she does take advice. She takes it in. But when it's something about her, because she forgets about self-care, she will dismiss a lot of people, even her own parents. And they say, hey, maybe you should sit down for a bit. She's like, no, I got this. And she'll move on. But in Isaac does it, she will actually listen to him. Um, and that's, and it's not because he, <laughs> he's smart. He doesn't tell her, you need to stop, go do this. He will just sort of pause her, you know, grab her by the shoulders and say, hey, we're going to go get something to eat right now. And and that and that's, he'll, he'll just let her know hey, you're going to pause and this is what we're going to go do. And that does not give her the opportunity to deny whatever it is or reject whatever it is. Because he, again, he understands her and it's for her and she gets that. But yeah, she, that that also plays into her passive aggressive, no, no, no. Um, it, it plays into her forgetting to take care of herself in lieu of the needs of others. She really does prioritize others above herself. And that, that is a, that's a huge problem for her. It's well, anyway, it's a, it it sort of steamrolls in the book. But yeah, that's kind of Lucretia, but we love Lucretia. I mean, I hope again, she's pretty much based on me. So we (laughs) love Lucretia because she cares so hard. She, she just cares so, so much and she will walk through fire for people that she cares about. She will take a bullet. She will do, I mean, there aren't bullets in my books, but you know what I mean. She, she will step in front of that charging lion and for your sake, she might not even know you, but she'll... She'll take good care of you if she feels that you are a good person. 
Now, if you are an evil person who is trying to hurt people, then she will let that lion maul you to death. She will allow that. She will be happy the lion was there. If you are a bad person with an ugly heart, um, she has no qualms about allowing that to go down. Uh, but if she cares about you and she's, or even if she doesn't even know you, but she feels you're good or she feels that, you know, just something is unjust, she, you, you will not find a better, a better hero who doesn't want to be a hero. You know, that's, she'll, she will pull you out of a crashing building and she will run back in and help you, help you down. That, that is that is who she is, and it is to her own detriment. She will push you out of the way of, of a charging bull just to get mauled herself on the horns. You know, that's, that, is, that is genuinely who she is. And yeah, she's a little, a little direct, and, and she is a control freak. Um, <laughs> she's a little bit of a control freak. She definitely wants people uh, to, you know, because she's pretty clever and because, you know, she is smart and she usually does see the situation in a certain way and she wants people to be safe or she wants people to do well. So she'll kind of try to boss people around sometimes, but honestly, it's usually for, it's, it's all, in her eyes, it's always for their own good. It's always for the betterment of things and, um, and she never forces, but she does get a little frustrated when all she wants is for people to do well and to have nice things. And she sees a path for them to do it. And she tells them, hey, if you do this, you're going to have great stuff happen to you. And they just go, nah, I'm not doing it. She gets really frustrated when people don't listen to her in that sense because she wants them to have those nice things. She wants them to do well. She wants them to survive. <laughs> you know, but... um. So she does, you know, and she never demands that people do X, Y, Z, but she is, she is a control freak, which honestly is another thing that frankly kind of makes her a good leader is that she's always paying attention to what's going on. So yeah, that's Lucretia in a nutshell. Uh, in the Lost Beacon Chronicles... Uh, well, and, I, and I'm not going to spoil what happens to you, but um, Lucretia suffers a lot in Spare the Swallow, and um, she has reasons to fall into a deep, 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 dark grieving process. And the Lost Beacon Chronicles are actually written as her going through the various stages of grief. Um, as many of you know, there are five stages of grief. Um, and, you know, according to the psychological things that I have read, they can go through at any, you can go through the stages of grief in any order and you can bounce back into them from time to time. You know, you can, you can go from, from anger to acceptance, but you can bounce out of acceptance sometimes <laughs> back into denial. And the grieving process is long and it's hard and it's different for every person. But Ignited is, which is the first book in the Lost Beacon Chronicles, is Lucretia's journey into anger, which, you know, the flames of anger are ignited within her heart. And when it starts, she is in a deep, dark depression. She's in the depression stage, you know, that, that stage of grief. So she, you know, you hear this book starts and it's, uh, she's sad all the time. Um, <laughs> and, uh, she actually, um, you know, and she's wandering and, and everything else. And again, I'm not going to give you spoilers. If you read Spare the Swallow, then you will know and deeply understand why she's so depressed <laughs> at the beginning of Ignited. Um, very justified. Uh, I think anyone would give her that. But Ignited is her journey into anger. And the subsequent chronicles um, the Lost Beacon Chronicles, says they are going to be taking her through her various stages of grief. 
Uh, the one after Ignited will be Rampage, and that is, I think I said that's coming out next year. Yeah, I need to write. Uh, <laughs> but Rampage, as you can tell, that's still in the anger phase. That's full-on anger. And then after that, she is going to be um, transitioning uh, into into another stage. I forgot which one it was. <laughs> but she will, uh, you know, it won't be, she won't bounce back to depression. She will bounce back to depression at some point, but... Yeah, she she's but the 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 Lost Speaking Chronicles. I'm actually really excited to take that kind of psychological spin on it and and deeply write through the stages of grief as a, some as a character is living through them. And I think it's I know it's going to be enjoyable for me to write and um, very emotional for me to write. And I think that um, a lot of people will find it relatable. Because we've all been through something that has caused us heavy grief. You know, book characters, of course, we can put them through the worst kind of pain and display it to the world. Uh, <laughs> but one of the reasons that fiction and, you know, fantasy and all that is so deeply relatable is because these characters are going through an emotional process that people find relatable. And that is something about Lucretia. She just is going through the pain. And <laughs> we all have suffered through that in one context or another. And we're all familiar with going through the stages of grief for one situation or another within our lifetimes. And, um, and some of us are still going through it. Some of us consistently have new reasons to to go through it and some of us are lucky and we don't have to go through it as often but i'm i'm really excited to write that and to and to have an entire book series sort of exploring that emotional grievance process and seeing how lucretia reacts to to each of these feelings as someone who frankly, has a lot of power, you know, who's, who's a pretty powerful mage who, but, and who is ambitious and clever, but, but also has a really big heart and really cares about what happens to others. So if you haven't already, check out Spare the Swallow and look for the first book in the Lost Beacon Chronicles, Ignited, November 16th. I'm going to do a cover reveal on October 6th. I've actually already designed the cover and I'm really excited about it because I just, I really enjoy designing book covers. So it's a good thing I'm an author, I guess, and that I can do my own things, but I'm really, really excited about the book cover. I'm really excited about the whole story. And um, I hope that you will get to know Lucretia better through that. And I hope that this gave you some insight into what makes her tick and what her motivations are even though i basically just jabbered for 30 minutes that's what this podcast is though it's jabbering very exciting stuff anyway uh as i said before the the to save a world and the queen witch of the rashan series they are Presently available for sale, work just starting work on Tear in the World, which will be out in 2024. And yeah, oh, and I'm also probably going to release a poetry book in 2024. Yeah, I've been talking with my publisher, 21 Chieftains Press, and they, um, okay, Sarah, who runs the publishing, <laughs> runs the publisher. And he's also a really close, dear friend of mine. Um, she, you know, she she's a wonderful poet as well. Definitely check out Behind Her City Eyes. She's got a couple other books coming out. Very excited for her. And excited to read them, frankly. But, uh, yeah, I'm gonna... I've, I've, I like to write poetry every once in a while. I enjoy that. And I've actually dabbled in it since I was a kid. I, um, I actually started writing poems when I was about nine years old. And... I was recently looking back on some of my old poems and I was like, I was insightful for a child. 
<laughs> or, you know, and, and frankly, all of my uh, nine and what, nine to 11 year old poems are pretty much all about animals, about like, you know, a cat listening to the breeze as it goes past in the garden and wondering what that cat hears on that wind. And, you know, little mountain goats standing on tall peaks and looking down upon the world, which is their great kingdom in the sky, and all that kind of little fanciful childhood thoughts. I was very much a, um, still very much an animal person. And when I was a little kid, I did not want dolls. I wanted horse model horses and stuffed animals and, you know, anything that was an animal. I was not a doll person. I, was, I didn't want the people toys. I wanted the animal toys. And that was really exciting for me. So I wrote poems about what I loved and my observances of their sweet, wonderful, <laughs> eclectic behavior. <laughs> and they were pretty good. And, uh, and I write other poems too, but I'm going to shove all that together and make it some semblance of organized and uh, put out a little poetry book. <laughs> so yeah, there's that. I'm just going to, I'm just going to do it all. And my mother keeps begging me to write a cookbook. Um, so who knows, maybe I'll, maybe I'll find time to do that too. It won't have any measurements. That's not how I cook. But thank you so much for listening. I genuinely appreciate it. And I genuinely appreciate all of you. I hope that you will come back and see me again.